be able to truly understand anything beyond my own senses. I am unable to think your thoughts and feel how you feel. But we could start a conversation, an honest conversation. Anxiety towards dental therapy has not changed significantly over the past 50 years. Publications report that about 5 to 20 percent of Americans voluntarily delay or avoid having needed dental treatment because of fear and anxiety. This avoidance behavior can become rather costly for a patient, resulting in compromised health and quality of life. As professionals and providers, it is imperative to work together in order to encourage patient ease in the dental office. All it takes is a touch of compassion. I look at this as a journey in dentistry of treating the anxious patient because that journey has transcended practicing dentistry to care. Because there's a big difference there. One can practice dentistry without providing good care, but you certainly can't do that with the fearful or the anxious patient. It's interesting because what logically makes sense doesn't work for these patients. If the patient asks a question, our natural response is to answer and to try to assure them how everything is going to be comfortable. But what we forget is that same patient was told by the last dentist that everything would be comfortable, and then it wasn't, over and over again for these patients. So what you have to do if you're really working with the high fear patient to, to get in touch with what their needs are is to start by sitting and listening, to listen to the patient in the patient's language, which means getting in touch with the patient in the non-verbal sense. It means mirroring our patient, a word called harage. Harage is a Japanese word. It means communicating gut to gut. It is the non-verbal communication. It's sitting eye level with your patient. It's using the same tone and tempo in your voice that the patient uses. It's using the same expressions of your face, of your body language. It's an amazing experience as you get in tune with your patient, you actually start to feel what your patient's feeling. And through that feeling, you can develop a true empathy that allows the two of you to communicate at a level that allows the patient to finally start to become more comfortable. I'll just hear it. It's okay. To be afraid. He asked me to make a gentleman upper and lower dentures, and he was in a chronic care, long term nursing home type of facility. And I was there one day treating him, and he was in a room with four other gentlemen 
with a bit of a curtain drawn in between for somewhat privacy. And while I was treating my patient, I couldn't help but overhearing this poor soul in the other part of the room that clearly was in a lot of pain. So I went down to the nurse's station and I said, gee, I'm so sorry to bother you, but there's a gentleman in this particular room that's really in a lot of pain. I think somebody should see him. And there I saw probably the best definition of care that I ever have. And I have not seen a better example of it since. The nurse was sitting on the edge of the bed and she had a cool face cloth over the gentleman's forehead. And she was holding his arm and simply stroking it. And she was just talking gently into his ear and he calmed right down. Now, that nurse did not have a magic elixir. She didn't have a magical pill or wave a wand that all his discomfort went away. But what she did was cared for him. And I never forgot that. Everybody has a story and I think it's up to the dentist to get that story in the open so that you can better treat the patient. It's important to understand that you're not alone. Patients are able to get through these steps to the point where now they're in continuing care. It is one of the most freeing moments for a truly high fear patient. That fear that they have is an area of their life that they feel they can't control, and now they can. And it's a huge step in self-esteem and in overall health for that reason. The intent of the Surgeon General's report on oral health is to alert Americans to the full meaning of oral health and its importance to general health and well-being. The report emphasizes that healthcare providers should be ready, willing, and able to work in collaboration to provide optimal health care for their patients. Having informed healthcare professionals will ensure that the public using the healthcare system will benefit from interdisciplinary services and comprehensive care. We asked some dental professionals to share their candid views on interprofessional collaboration and the value in providing quality care for the highly fearful patient. Here's what they had to say. They're terrified of going to a physician. I think A, they just have a phobia of walking into the office and B, they are afraid that the physician will look at them, put them down because they did not go to treat these medical problems earlier when they could have been solved more easily. And so, for example, they may have angina, pain in their chest, and just because of their fear of, of walking into the medical office, they won't go. And of course, that can lead to serious problems. From a self-esteem point of view, I think the patient realizes that they need to go, but are so terrified uh, that they look at themselves in a lesser light overall as well. And so it affects them in that regard. Our uh, interaction is typically with, say, a cardiologist to evaluate a heart murmur or mantra about prolapse, maybe, maybe an ENT for a sinus issue, 
or uh, you know otitis media that correlates to a toothache. So on the medical side, there is some of that, but typically on the psychological side, it doesn't happen that frequently. We manage it as best as we can. The best way to make interprofessional relationships a reality is basically just having open communication with all the different health professionals that your particular patient is seeing. So not being afraid to get on the phone and call their physician or call if they have a social worker or if they have a nurse uh, just to make sure that you guys are all kind of discussing what kind of treatment this patient needs. Everybody has a different technique to manage their patients. Um, for me personally, it's been talking to the patient, making sure that they're feeling comfortable, and trying to address what their questions are. Why do you fear? What is the root cause of fear? Or what is the uh, root cause for anxiety? So I intend to address those and make sure that you know they are comfortable in my presence so that we can go far with the treatment. So in the practice, when patients come into the office, I try to break down barriers right away. And I like to be called by my first name. I want my patients to be my friends. And I do that out of my heart because I want to build empathy and, and compassion. compassion. And when we see a patient that's under duress, that's stressed out, that suffered a loss possibly, even beyond the fear related to the dental visit, it's such an easy thing to extend compassion by, by touching their shoulder and making them feel that they're in a place where they're going to be treated the way I would want to be treated. As providers and professionals, let us not work for or against one another, but with each other to become a symbol of unity, to understand the whole patient, to provide comprehensive care, and to do it all with a compassionate touch. Compassionate touch. Compassionate touch. Go into an office, and if you're not comfortable, you can always leave. Remember that it's your choice, it's your decision, and you can do this. I believe it's important that you speak to your dentist or any other healthcare professional about your fears so that you don't avoid the care that you need. Despite their fears and perhaps low self esteem because of that, we welcome them, we want them to come in, we're not going to put them down for not addressing their past concerns because of their anxiety. Please come see us, we're here to help. like this are so hard to replay I've walked this path before it's clear in my mind what future is in store and I would rather be holding you but that's needless to say what do I do when I've found a game I can play What do I do when I've found a game I can't play? How can we find a way? I wish that I knew what you want me to say. Now that we've come this far, what will it take to get back in your arms? I would rather be holding you, but that's needless to say. What do I do when I've found a game I can play? What do I do when I've found a game I can play? Realize we are all in this together, and most importantly, there is hope. my eyes reminiscing of time with you and I would rather be holding you but that
That's needless to say What do I do 